नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू द पॉडकास्ट सीरीज टाइटल स्टॉल वॉट स्पीक फॉर आई ए पी ए टूडे वी हैव डॉक्टर जयजीत भट्टाचार्य एज आर एस्टीम गेस्ट ऑल ऑफ अस नो द डॉक्टर जयजीत भट्टाचार्य इज अ नोटेड एक्सपर्ट इन द अरीना ऑफ गवर्नेंस एंड सोसाइटल ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन लीवरेजिंग डिजिटल टेक्नोलॉजीज डॉक्टर भट्टाचार्य इज प्रेजिडेंट ऑफ सेंटर ऑफ डिजिटल इकोनॉमी पॉलिसी रिसर्च एंड इज ऑल्सो सी ई ओ ऑफ अ फिनटेक्स सेटअप बिफोर दिस डॉक्टर जयजीत भट्टाचार्य हैज सर्व सेवरल कॉरपोरेट ऑर्गनाइजेशन एज वेल एज थिंक टैंक्स इंक्लूडिंग डब्ल्यू ई एफ डॉक्टर जयजीत भट्टाचार्य हैज सेवरल पब्लिकेशन टू हिज क्रेडिट एंड हैज ऑल्सो ऑथर्ड फाइव बुक्स related to the aspect of e-governance and digital transformation his academic background is equally impressive with phd from iit delhi welcome dr jayajit bhattacharya first and foremost dr bhattacharya we've seen you transcending your career uh, from corporate as i said even to academics when you have been with iit delhi and at present you are president of an organization which is a thought leader in several ways however what tantalizes me is the name of the organization can you please go into the depth of how did you coin this word center for digital economy and public policy formulation yeah okay. so actually it's center for digital economy policy research right okay. and um, this is actually formed in around 2009 okay and by 2011 we had actually registered it mm-hmm. um and the reason was very clear was that um, increasingly we saw that the world is moving towards an economy that is driven by digital okay even though the term digital economy was not there or not very popular not known mm-hmm. we kind of coined that term because we realized that the economy will be driven by technology mm-hmm. every aspect of our life how we live how we even fight how we conduct wars mm-hmm. how we send uh, letters everything will be controlled by digital okay so in fact if you look at the camera that's recording us the way it's going to stream mm-hmm. online directly that's all being driven by by digital mm-hmm. and that wasn't the case um two decades ago mm-hmm. uh, so we saw that coming in 2009 2010 and we realized that it's going to impact everything including government mm-hmm. and you know from 2000 onwards i have been uh, working very closely in uh, digitalizing the government which mm-hmm. used to be called e governance in fact that's why i wrote the first book on mm-hmm. e governance in this country it was uh, mm-hmm. which was released by the then president abdul kalam mm. was because of this reason that technology mm. was going to fundamentally change mm. how we conduct every aspect of our life mm-hmm. and therefore it was important to have a platform through which we could start communicating with various stakeholders of the society including the government mm-hmm. as to how this impact is going to come in mm-hmm. the positive and negative impact of this uh, particular technology in fact in 2012 we held a seminar <coughs> on e politics okay because we realized the impact that technology will bring mm-hmm. on politics okay uh, we predicted that people will be influenced to vote mm-hmm. in a certain manner because mm-hmm. you could actually explore the kind of narration one would have and mm-hmm. actually know what are the what is it that people are looking for mm-hmm. and influence them in a mass manner mm-hmm. uh, which would then make them vote in a certain way Mm-hmm. and we subsequently saw things like the blue whale game coming in where you could actually drive people mm. 10000 kilometers away to actually self destruct mm, yeah, right true. and uh, if you could self destruct mm. you could also influence them to vote in a certain That's manner right. is that what democracy is about mm-hmm. then you start questioning many of these things mm-hmm. for example in in your institution have mm-hmm. uh, you know often come and talked about how technology is changing mm-hmm. governance and um, uh, land records was a public a uh, document right mm-hmm. was a public information before technology came in mm-hmm. what happened after technology came in mm-hmm. now we can go and find out that this piece of land is owned by whom mm-hmm. which is a very dangerous thing compared to what was earlier where i would go and find your name mm-hmm. and see what land you have based on your approval true now i can search the other way around yeah. which means i'm actually putting your life in danger Mm-hmm. and i can do it at a mass scale and and things mm-hmm. have been impacted uh, mm-hmm. things have happened in this country mm-hmm. where people have gone through the obituaries took out the name done a massive search to find out what piece of land they own wow. if their children live outside of india okay. and if they do uh-huh. then through fraud they would convert the land records into their, their own, own name names, okay. and the children can't come back because you know they okay. are so caught up in in us or wherever they are okay. that's the impact of technology okay. and that's the impact of privacy also okay, because i am in a way violating privacy using technology true so these were issues which were unheard of right um you would fundamentally argue that well land records is public information public uh-huh. should have it 
Yeah. Now you can't do that when uh, technology comes in. So many things changed um, as technology was coming in. So it was important for us to start pointing out that what are the changes that will happen in mm. governance in in how people live in mm. politics and democracy there's a whole question mark now on democracy mm. if you are not able to think freely yeah. and i'm influencing everything that you're thinking is yeah. that really a free will and is that really a vote coming through free will it is not mm -hmm. and so are we really having democracy post mm. the advent of the of the digital era mm. it's a big question mark now 20 years later it's clearer to people as to what we were saying and i think that's that's why we set up this uh, this center for doing research in these areas you were speaking about technology economy trade commerce yes. and privacy and governance in the same breath yes okay how do you connect the dots how do you link trade and uh, economy with the technology so um, what we have seen is um, that trade and economy and technology that linkage is not a recent phenomena it okay. did not happen because of internet or because of digital okay this was a phenomena that was there for for mm -hmm. billions of years anybody okay. who had technology had mm -hmm. more wealth okay and people were always in the pursuit of wealth okay and therefore to get wealth they would get mm -hmm. technology if you mm -hmm. invented the wheel Uh -huh. you were more superior to others okay. you could build a chariot mm -hmm. if you could build a chariot you could put a horse in front and you could then conquer other lands and get more wealth mm -hmm. right if you cut down to let's say the the 16th and 17th century yeah india was one of the richest countries in the world that's mm -hmm. undoubtedly mm -hmm. so i don't need to prove that but mm -hmm. we didn't become rich by selling vegetables to europe okay. or exporting uh wheat to other places okay we became rich by exporting technologically advanced products can you elaborate this more oh yeah absolutely you know if mm. you look at let's say netherlands 80% okay. of the textile imports came from mm. bengal just okay. one single place textile is an outcome of uh, technology mm. okay and the finest of clothes were mm. being made there okay if you look at let's say any defense equipment in mm -hmm. in in the 16th and 17th century mm. worth its salt it had to have wood steel mm -hmm. which is a high carbon steel okay india where the leaders or actually the only entity in the world which mm -hmm. could produce wood steel we are the only ones who had the technology okay if you look at brass for example mm. the high quality brass would need pure zinc okay nobody else in the world could could manufacture pure zinc mm. because of the way the zinc behaves you know the moment you yeah. you melt it in next 10 to 15 degrees it will evaporate mm -hmm. so it required a very very different technology to actually capture zinc in a high purity form and then mix it with copper and other elements and mm. create a very high quality Hello. brass okay india controlled that technology for a very very long time till the time it got stolen by the chinese in around 17th century or 16th okay. century okay. from zoravar mines and oh. then in the next century the british stole it okay. took it back to to uk mm -hmm. to britain and they patented it okay and then surprisingly 200 years later they came back and uh, and gave the license to hindustan zinc limited okay. to mine in the same mines from where they stole the technology right and that is where the control of technology becomes so important in fact if i go back to um, the 7th century mm -hmm. for a long time the tang dynasty kept pestering mm -hmm. the the harshavardhan empire that please give us the sugar technology okay sugar was invented in india in fact okay. it was invented during the harappan times and we uh -huh. controlled that technology very very closely okay. for thousands of years we controlled it okay when harshavardhan continuously denied access of technology to the tang dynasty mm. they actually banded the tibetans and the and the mm. nepalese together mm -hmm. and they sent a raiding force down the gangetic plain okay they killed 3000 people captured those who were manufacturing sugar took them back to china okay. and then china became one of the largest producers of uh, of sugar okay. which is why sugar is now called chini which actually means it from comes chi from china okay right and that's the change in narration that has happened uh -huh. otherwise sugar comes a word sharkara okay which is uh, from sanskrit. ganna from yeah. sanskrit right true uh -huh. and uh, and that's how shakar mm. word comes in from the arabic okay. but chini came in because we started importing you know uh, sugar okay. from from china and because they had stolen that technology from india and this has been happening again and again and again and again so jay ji you opened my eyes to a very different way of looking at technology and economy so are you trying to tell me that patents and ipr is the crux to technology being the master of technology yes in fact um, mm. um you know if you look at let's say the railway technology right. you know the steam engine as an example right um and there's always a joke around it that somebody asks a child um who invented the steam engine the child says what and you say yes you know that's the right answer because okay. james watt supposedly invented the steam engine Good and i'm just trying to explain ipr uh, and patents in that uh, context uh, now 
if you look at what James Watt really did was that he took the technology from others and he had the ability to patent it because he got access to the right kind of offices. Not only do, did he do that, he also extended his patent by 30 years because he had control over the British Parliament. Okay. In that entire regime, when mm. he had the patent, mm -hmm. he almost killed the railway technology because it did not allow anyone else to contribute to it. Okay. And it was such an inefficient technology that it would, it would cost more okay. to send goods over the railway line mm -hmm. than the cost of the goods itself. Okay. So you would not use a railway line, right? Okay. It's only when the patent expired mm. and all the engineers got together and created an open source journal called the Lean's Engine Reporter. Mm -hmm. And they freely contributed their ideas of how to improve the steam engine. Okay. That steam engine really started getting used in the real world and its its productivity went up significantly. Mm. Same is the story with bessemerization. In fact, steam engine and bessemerization are the two pillars of industrial revolution, right? Mm -hmm. Both of them benefited from opening up the technology, not by patenting it, not by okay. putting, you know, uh, uh, layers over on top of it or, okay. or putting regulations on top of it. And so if you cut to the 1960s and so on, uh, mm. that's a time when we saw large number of professors being exported into India and other developing countries mm -hmm. to teach us mm -hmm. what is patent and what is IPR and so on and so forth. It was with the vengeance that from the 1960s onwards, it uh, became a very, very critical issue. Mm -hmm. Now, why was it a critical issue in 1960s? Why was it not a big issue before that? Mm -hmm. Why didn't, for that matter, J.C. Bose patent radio once mm -hmm. he invented it, right? Mm -hmm. And he was being asked by Annie Bus mm -hmm. and then everybody else to go ahead and patent mm -hmm. it because it was not important in those days, right? Okay. Um, there were a few patents, there were critical patents, mm. but um, patent as a geopolitical tool mm. started being pushed from 1960s onwards. Okay. Now, what do I mean by a geopolitical tool? Mm. And what was so critical about 1960s? Why 1960s? Why not 50s? Why not 40s? Mm -hmm. Why didn't we have professors visiting my alma mater at IIT mm. Kanpur before that? It was because that was a time when the last of the colonies start getting independent. Okay. It was in the 60s that the last of the colonies started getting independent. So the empire was slipping like. So if I am from a place where I have a high standard yeah. of living because I'm extracting value okay. from other economies and if those economies have become independent, how do I maintain my standard of living? Very true. How do I control my people who will mm. suddenly say you are a poor government because we're not getting the same benefits? Mm. You look at this very simple situation. Mm -hmm. A barber in US will do about 10 heads in a day. Yeah. Right. And then what does he do? He goes into his car, drives mm -hmm. home, stays in the apartment. It may not be the best of cars. It may not be the best of apartments, but he, he lives still. in a house, has a car and he mm -hmm. does that. Now, is that an increase in productivity? A mm -hmm. barber in India probably does 20 heads in a day. Mm -hmm. And he still probably... He stays in a, uh, in a hut. Chha. He walks back home. He can't afford even a bus. Mm -hmm. Right. And what is the difference? If you are saying that's a productivity increase that has happened in the US economy or European economy, how? No. The only productivity increase that has happened is that we have been able to or they have been able Pay. to extract mm. more value from the other economies than what they have been generating internally and saying mm. that is the increase in productivity. Okay. That is not the increase in productivity. Okay. So what I basically did was I went ahead and redefined what colonization is. Yes, I remember that. 15 years ago, you coined this word digital colonization. Yes. Yes. What is it all about? Is it linked to the same narrative you're talking absolutely, about? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. In fact, you know, I was actually working with the Chinese government at that time and mm. that was when it was a penny dropping moment. So mm. um, it was very clear to the Chinese also that um, somehow they are being kept out of the entire technology ecosystem. Mm. And as I mentioned, technology is the key to wealth, mm -hmm. right? And um, if you are not able to get into the technology ecosystem, you are kept outside and you're kept poor. Mm. So let me take an example again of what I mean by the technology ecosystem. Let's mm. say you're a very smart uh, engineer mm. who um, has developed a better prefetch queue mm. in a processor. Right. Right. Now, what will you do with the prefetch queue? You don't build the processor. Mm -hmm. So you will go to a, a Intel or a Motorola it, yeah. or somebody who builds these processors, true, right? True, and you will true. go and say, hey, within your processor, I've got a better technology. Can you take true, it? True, true. And you would have probably spent your entire family's wealth because it takes $25,000 to do the me. patent. True. Right? And and what will they say? They will say that, look, um, maybe your, your technology is good. Mm. So give it to us and we'll give you 10 patents in return. Or I don't need your technology because I will define what is the state of the art. Mm -hmm. Your technology may be better, but uh -huh. if it never comes to the market, 
It's never the benchmark. It's never the benchmark, True. right? Oh. And therefore, I will not let you come into my ecosystem at oh. all. Okay. Right now, if I say, well, I'll give you ten other patents. You give me your patent, I'll give you ten patents. That's a fair deal. Mm-hmm. It's not a fair deal. What will you do with those eleven patents? Mm-hmm. You don't have the the market access. You don't have the capital. Good. You don't have got you know access to people. You don't have access to anything. Mm-hmm. What will you do as a lone engineer? You can't do much. Mm-hmm. What will you do as a small country? You can't do much. Mm-hmm. What will you do where your as a country your resources are more focused towards you know feeding your people because you've already been mm-hmm. uh, uh, deprived of the resources? Mm-hmm. You can't do much, right? And therefore, the regime that was set up uh, was that. I would put patents mm. and I'll take those technologies and I'll create make them standards. Mm. So the way the camera is working, the way everything else is working, they're driven by standards, mm. such as MP4 being one of the standards. Yeah, and true. in fact, that reminds me of something that happened with China. I'll come to that. Okay. So I'll put these uh, patented technology as standards. Mm. Then I'll start extracting disproportionate economic mm. benefit out of it. And that's how I had defined uh, colonization. I'll come mm. to the definition also. Right. And when you get the monopolistic rent out of it, you'll use extra money to go back and, ch- and change the your technology own economy. True. and you will change the technology okay. again okay. you'll go to the next level so and you, next level okay so we are here uh, almost in the month of november you'll see mm. the talk ticking in terms of technology because by december christmas time comes in things start selling now so you'll move it to the next technology now if you are from a developing country you'll never be able to catch up mm-hmm. right because old technology becomes obsolete mm-hmm. you now somebody comes and tells you every four five years your laptop has become obsolete why has it become obsolete mm-hmm. you're still doing spreadsheets you're still yeah. doing word processing true, true. you're still doing presentations yes, yes what is it different that you're doing mm-hmm. so why has your laptop become obsolete suddenly because nobody's servicing it because the new products on that because year. i'm dumping obsolete software onto it because mm-hmm. i'm dumping bloatware onto it mm-hmm. i'm slowing down your your uh, laptop mm-hmm. i'm slowing down your phone mm-hmm. And, you know, so many of these phone manufacturers have been caught. Absolutely. Mm. So the way I redefined colonization to explain what was going on and to to, to communicate to the policymakers is that Mm. colonization is not control of, um, you know, Mm. one country or the other country. It's uh, extracting disproportionate economic benefit Mm. through either deceit or change of rules Mm. or through um, a direct force and control. Okay. Right. And there were three phases of colonization in my view. Mm. The first was social colonization, okay. where in every um, economy, in every mm. country, you'd have the top level mm. or top strata of society extracting social disproportionate economic benefit from the other strata. Right. Okay. You had that upper caste in India, mm, you know, not them. doing much work mm. and getting others to work for them. True. You had the same in Java, in Indonesia. You had the Japanese, the, mm. the British. They had the lords over there who'd be quote unquote mm. lording over yeah and um, and that's mm. how all the economies were structured mm. then suddenly they realized that if we can go and control a whole set of other people mm-hmm. we'll get more benefit out of it and that is where we had the classical political military colonization okay in the 60s when that got over mm-hmm. how do i maintain my lifestyle i still have to not work much and get benefit mm. from everybody else and i can pass it off as increase in my productivity okay. how do i do that i do that by technology. making by technology mm. by still making you work hard mm. i'll control technology a lot let you have access to technology mm. you can use it by only paying disproportionate benefits to me okay we all know that apple phones cost about 200 dollars right yeah. mm. and they uh, for their manufacturing and they sell mm. for about a thousand dollars is ipr worth 800 dollars Mm. Who's paying for our IPR on uh, on steel, on wood steel, mm. on on trigonometry, on calculus? Who's giving us the IPR on on yoga, right? If you start taking IPR on all of these mm. things, right? In fact, if I if mm. I cut back to what um, the British did to 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 kind of take technology away from India, very very explicitly was in 1814, they passed a law in their parliament which stopped any ship above 350 ton. From mm-hmm. being an Indian ship, mm-hmm. because the Indian ships were decimating the British mm-hmm. ships because we were technologically far superior. Mm-hmm. Our cost of operations our ships were much lower. Mm-hmm. Their life cycle was much higher, mm-hmm. and the shipwrights in Britain actually went to the king and said, mm-hmm. "If you do not stop the Indians from operating, we will die. We'll die of starvation. Mm-hmm. And when your Royal Navy needs help and support and repairs, you won't find us. Okay. And therefore, to be Atma Nirbhar, Mr. Mm-hmm. King, mm-hmm. you would need to stop the Indian ships from." Mm. Uh, driving us to starvation. Mm-hmm. And so, 
uh, they stopped the ships which were above uh, below 350 tons. Mm -hmm. And why below 350 tons? Because the British did not have the ability to build mm -hmm. ships above 350 tons. They still needed the Indian ships. Mm -hmm. But that took away about 40% of shipbuilding from mm -hmm. uh, Bengal yes. and from Meerut, okay. uh, from Surat. Okay. Uh, because those were the two hubs of hubs uh, so. shipbuilding. Yeah. Subsequently, next year, they came out with another law saying that uh, no Indian ship mm -hmm. can operate between the transatlantic route, which is between Europe and, uh, and Americas. Why was that? Because that was the most lucrative trade route ever. Okay. The ships would go from, from the continent, from Europe to Africa, pick up slaves, take them to Americas, mm -hmm. dump the slaves, pick up gold, take them to US, dump mm -hmm. the gold, go back to Africa, pick up slaves and keep going doing okay. that. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the bigger the ships were, the better it was. And the, in the mm -hmm. Indian ships were best suited for that. Okay. They were big, comfortable, they could carry all of this load. Mm -hmm. And um, the British could not uh, compete against Indian ships. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they passed laws which essentially mm -hmm. took away the market from the Indian ships. Mm -hmm. Once you have taken away the market, then what mm -hmm. is your technology? It's pretty much like the... Uh, the prefetch queue that I mentioned, yeah. even if you've got a better prefetch queue, it doesn't matter. Even if you have Nobody's better ships, it, yeah. it doesn't matter. So what will happen in five years, ten years time down the line, you will not have the technology at all. So now you are technologically backward, mm -hmm. right? Because I've not allowed your technology to come forward. Jajit, can you explain this uh, hypothesis and uh, help me to understand why did India lose out in digital game? I mean, Indians are doing very well, but somewhere India has not been the superpower it could have been. Is this all connected? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, some of it is attributed to a short sightedness, clearly. But some of it is because of interference from elsewhere. Okay. Um, as recent a case as um, one of our rocket scientists being put behind bars for 10 years, mm -hmm. um, Mr. Nambi Narayan, mm -hmm. um, because there was false cases of uh, espionage put against him. He was the mm -hmm. biggest of patriots, one of the most, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. experts in cryogenic engine. Mm -hmm. Our program got delayed by 10 years. If you look at anyone who was involved in strategic projects in India, mm -hmm. they have not died a natural death. Okay. Homi Baba did not die a natural death, okay. right? If you look at a whole bunch of people, even when um, the Chandrayaan was taking off, uh -huh. uh, one of the key scientists got bashed on an empty road by a truck. How can then be a truck which is, you know, hits a, a vehicle uh -huh. in Sri Hari Kota on an empty road? Uh -huh. So there are examples after examples where we see a challenge. But let me also take up, you know, one or two examples of where probably we shot ourselves in the foot. Uh -huh. um, you know, since I see a lot of uh, pictures of Indira Gandhi in your institution, mm. the first television set in Indira Gandhi's house mm. was from Siri Pilani. Okay. Uh, that was a Siri Pilani technology, a completely Indian technology. Mm. We are one of the foremost uh, countries in the world to have that technology. Okay. In right, Asia, we were one of the first ones. Okay. Uh, even Japan did not have the technology. They were licensing the technology from elsewhere. We had the technology. Okay. In 19, and this was made by a bunch of young scientists. Okay. In 1979, the then director of Siri Pilani mm. sent out a letter to the government asking that mm. uh, now that we have built the black and white television, mm -hmm. could you allow us to build the color television? Mm -hmm. And we need a little funding. Uh -huh. And uh, in their great wisdom, the response that came in from the government was that India does not need color television. So be it. And the young team dissipated because technology is not what you write in the books. Technology is what's in people's Actually, mind and who are working. True, because true. they'll then build the next technology, the next technology. What I mentioned true. about what happens every November when true. the technology clock ticks oh, to the next yeah. level. Mm. We lost out. A couple of years later, 1982, Asian Games came in. 1981, all imports of uh, color television was freely allowed. Mm. So what happened to our brands? Have you heard of ECTV? It's gone. Have you heard of Keltron, Beltron? Yeah. Those, those were household names. True. They vanished. They vanished and now we are flooded with, uh, with international, uh, uh, international uh, mm -hmm. consumer electronics to the extent if you recollect four or five years back the situation was that our imports of electronics was crossing our oil import bill. Mm -hmm. That was how much we were, ex we were importing mm -hmm. because we destroyed our electronics industry systematically. The 1979 case is just one example. We did that consistently again and again. In fact, um, there was a case again with Siri Pilani where, uh, by, by the way, let me just complete the previous point because mm -hmm. one of the young uh, scientists and engineers, he got left behind and he did not quit Siri Pilani. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he became the director of Siri Pilani. So he mm -hmm. went to the archives and checked out how much did the then director ask from the government to build a color television? It was 1 lakh 7,000 rupees. So for 1 lakh 7,000 rupees, we India, destroyed our, uh, our uh, entire uh, industry. Consumer. So we had a situation where our tanks required a certain uh, Motorola processor. 
and Motorola said, well, I'm sorry, those processors mm. are end of life. Now we move to the next one, you know, next mm. generation, better ones. Uh -huh. But tanks could, just can't take better ones, you know, okay. they are made in a certain way. So India mm. begged, they knelt, they cried, they said, please, you know, in the name of mm. God, God Almighty, please give us a few processors, otherwise our tanks will become basically rust mm. bowls. So they said, no, we can't. Mm. So government went back to Siri Pilani and said, can you please help out in uh, building these processors? Mm -hmm. And um, these young engineers again went around and they scouted the country. Can anybody help us in building microprocessors? Mm. They went to Professor P.P. Chakravarti of IIT Kharagpur, was a doyen of uh, processors in those days, and said, can you help out? Mm. And he, he kind of read out the riot act to them that, look, mm. you're on your own. Nobody in this country can help out. There are very few people in the world who actually know this technology. So you're on your own. Do what you want to do. Okay. Fortunately, at that point in time, one of the Motorola engineers had written a book which had all the calls of the processor. Okay. So what these young scientists of Siri Pilani did, they worked day and night, 14-15 hours a day, mm. to reverse engineer these calls and mm. build the processor on a breadboard. Okay. And they had the processor. Okay. So they came back to the government and said, look, now we have the processor, can you now fund us to put it into silicon? Because uh -huh. you will take it to Taiwan, yeah, put sure. it into semiconductor. But now we have mm. the technology. The next step is pretty mm -hmm. much a very small mm -hmm. step. Again, in their wisdom, the government said, look, uh, we have been told by Motorola that they are going to give us the process. We have now got the process. We really don't need what you've built. So again, you know, government obviously has got better visibility to the researchers and so on and so forth. The research says, fine, you know, that's that's your call. You are the government. But um, mm. can we give it free to our universities? Because they need they to learn. True. Otherwise, the books don't teach us much. You know, we but have also learned microprocessors. why do they need an approval? Why do they need an approval for Because that? it was uh, a project uh, given by the government. It was controlled okay. by government. And okay. therefore, uh, and, uh, if the government does not get to give approval, mm. it will be against the rules of the government, of the GFR rules. Mm. And uh, again, the response that came in was that, um, and I'm, I'm kind of quoting it verbatim because it was mm. told to me in that manner, mm. is that, uh, do we know, know who owns the Taj Mahal? We can't give it away. We don't know who owns this. We, you can't give it away. You can't give it to the universities. And so we were at the cutting edge of microprocessors and we could not teach our own people, our own students as to how to build microprocessors. We lost out. Mm -hmm. Now you tell me, is that something that um, happens normally? Yeah, the mm -hmm. question that you asked and why can't we just teach it, uh, you know, train our next generation of students? We're saying you don't build it, that's fine, but at least can I pass the technology? Jaijit, is it a systematic degeneration of creativity that happened in the past that killed us? I don't know if I can say that because we had a whole host of uh, Nobel laureates and technology coming in, mm. especially till about 47. You know, we had the, mm. the most brilliant of minds globally, um, mm. you know, J.C. Bose, S.N. Bose, mm. uh, Raman and so on and so forth, a whole bunch of uh, mm. people who were coming in. Post-1947, once we gained freedom, we didn't have the same velocity of, uh, of, of uh, technology uh, scientists uh, in our country. We had Nobel laureates, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Nobel laureates in, in peace, Nobel laureates in, in everything else, but not in technology, mm -hmm. right? We had Indians going to US and then getting the Nobel laureate, but mm -hmm. not in the country. In our country. Uh, why is that? What is it that we are lacking? What is holding us back? Uh, where is it that our engineers and scientists are not able to get into the ecosystem? And mm. that is the ecosystem I'm talking about. That is the club that we are not able to break in. And that's where the you, the you know, the Chinese government woke up in roughly around 2004, mm. saying, "Look, this is not working out. Mm. You are not letting us in, and there is something wrong that we sense." In fact, at that point in time, China mm. passed a regulation saying anybody who's manufacturing any Wi-Fi product must mm. also support the WAPI protocol. Okay. So Wi-Fi follows a 802.11 uh, mm. standard. Again, it's mm. a standard which has got a lot of patents mm. around yeah, it, right? Yeah, true, true. So the Chinese said, fine, we also have our own technology called WAPI, which also does wireless mm. LAN. Yeah. In fact, India also had its own technology. IIT Kanpur had its mm. own wireless LAN mm. protocol. So not a big deal. It was mm. just that people had agreed to it. Mm. Once they agreed to it, they spread the patent Propagate. between themselves, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm. And so China said, fine. I mean, all I'm saying is that you support both the standards. On that issue, there were 20 rounds of discussion between Madame Wu, who was the mm. Vice Premier of China, and Dick Cheney, who was the Vice President of US. Mm -hmm. 20 rounds of discussion on a small technology standard. Mm. At the same time, if you recollect, there was 16 rounds of discussion between Steve Talbot, 
mm. and Jaswant Singh, both were junior to the vice president and the vice premier mm. of their of respective China. countries, yeah. on the issue of nuclear deal. Okay. So you can you can imagine Which that the, the level, small WAPI uh, standard was of a higher priority uh -huh. than the nuclear, nuclear deal. Nuclear deal, right? right? That is the importance of technology because mm. technology leads to wealth. Mm -hmm. Wealth leads to prosperity. Okay. Right. And so if then, I'm, what is digital monopoly then? So what is happening if I, you know, uh, if I cut forward, in fact, let me take another Chinese example uh, before I come to what is digital monopoly because it will give the background. Mm -hmm. um, as I was talking about MP4 because the mm -hmm. cameras use MP4 and, you know, if you ask any engineering student. It's a standard. It's a standard. Everybody yeah. knows, everybody can build yeah. it and there's no big deal. Uh -huh. So uh, DVD players being churned out uh, out of mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. And they were all using MP4 as a standard. In those days, uh, the DVD players were selling for about $120 in mm -hmm. US. Mm -hmm. So one company from Japan and one company from Europe, from Netherlands, descended in China and said, we have got 550 patents between us and MP4. Mm -hmm. You need to give us $20 out of the money that you're earning. Okay. So China reluctantly agreed because out of $120, you could give, give $20, still mm -hmm. get some profit and, and mm -hmm. run your business. Pretty quickly, DVD mm -hmm. players were selling for about $40, $42 in Walmart. Uh -huh. Out of $42, $20 was manufacturing cost. Mm -hmm. $20 was the royalty. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese were getting only $1 to $2 for all the hard work and toil that they were putting in. Now you will understand what is digital colonization. I put my patents in on a format which anybody could have built. Right. Right. And mm -hmm. the only difference is that I put my, um, my uh, uh, patents on top of it and I got my club to agree to it. Mm -hmm. Now if anybody else uses it, they can use it. Mm -hmm. But you have to pay a disproportionate economic benefit to me. True. Is that productivity? That is not productivity. productivity. I'm making you work harder mm -hmm. and I'm extracting that money out for me. It's and a hegemony. <laughs> it's a hegemony. True. Right? Which is why colonization, there was no other word to use. It was digital colonization. True. And many people would tell me, oh, you're being so jingoistic, Jaiji, this is not the way, you know, why are you calling it colonization? Mm -hmm. It was nothing but colonization. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, because people were getting very shocked by the word that we are not under digital colonization. We are free people. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, fair, fair enough. Then do you have technological sovereignty? Mm -hmm. Is this it's the same, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. issue in a different way? You don't have control over your technology, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where the issue of monopoly starts coming okay. in. The digital monopoly starts coming in. Mm -hmm. If I talk about, let's say, 2010. Mm -hmm. um, if under the Patriot Act of uh, the US government, they mm -hmm. had asked American Express, mm -hmm. Visa and MasterCard to stop doing business in India. Mm -hmm. What would be the impact of digital economy in India? Mm -hmm. It would have been completely finished mm -hmm. because all transactions happening on one of these mm -hmm. platforms mm -hmm. and our economy would have come down to its knees, mm -hmm. right? We didn't have control over financial technologies, mm -hmm. which is where Rupee and UPI started coming in, which mm -hmm. was one of the first Atma Nirbha steps in that, in in that sense, right? True, true. Um, now, if I look at, um, let's say the .in mm -hmm. as our URL, right? So mm -hmm. India has got .in. Yeah, true. Uh, Denmark has, you know, the Germany has got .de and so on and so forth. Many of our sites are on .in. Mm -hmm. If I go to the 13 root servers and delete .in, mm -hmm. right, because I have control over it, Mm -hmm. What will happen to e-commerce in India? What will happen to the digital economy in India? Now imagine that you are going into mm -hmm. your, your military is going onto a situational issue in the borders. Uh -huh. While the, the military is going, you delete dot .in and you stop all your, uh, all the IoT financial transactions from happening. Yeah, even the critical information. So your entire yeah. supply chain collapses in the back. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to get fuel. You will not be able to transport people. You will not be able to do any of that because your, your digital economy starts collapsing. Mm. Because you don't have control on any of these technologies. Mm. Now, if you look at, let's say, the way we um, mm. we have our social narration nowadays, right? It's over Twitter, mm -hmm. it's over Google, uh, WhatsApp, and so on and so forth. Do we control any of these technologies? Mm -hmm. We don't. Mm. But is it necessary to control any of these technologies? Now, the necessity comes from the fact mm -hmm. that if need be, can we get them to align to the requirements of our people and our mm. society? Yeah. Repeatedly, we have seen that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. In fact, in yesterday's newspaper, we saw Google saying we have, we have now very kindly reduced the amount that will charge from startups from 30%, which is usurious, to 15%, which is still usurious. Mm -hmm. You're doing nothing. 
you have simply put up a platform you're hosting it it does require effort you know we are not demeaning that it does require a lot of effort it does require a lot of resources but not 15 percent of somebody else's earnings Mm. Pretty much similar to the DVD player example, which is why mm. I wanted to take the DVD mm. player example mm. first to explain Makes sense, how yeah, yeah. money is getting extracted. Mm. It fits back into my definition of extracting disproportionate economic benefit. Mm-hmm. When, it, when you're extracting disproportionate economic benefit, you can do it only when you have some kind of a control. That mm. control either comes through the regulations mm-hmm. or the trade treaties you have signed okay. or through mm. the monopolistic existence okay. that you have in the market okay can you stop whatsapp today in this country mm-hmm. even as the government do you have the power to mm-hmm. stop uh, mm-hmm. whatsapp in this country you cannot can you stop twitter in this country mm-hmm. can you stop google play store in this country mm-hmm. what if google stops its uh, google maps tomorrow mm-hmm. millions of drivers will go jobless Stranded. Mm-hmm. Your ola uber everything will go because they will that's become the jobless. backbone yeah right seven million drivers out there they'll become jobless and many other businesses will go out of business mm-hmm. So they have a power greater than the government in the digital domain, which is where digital monopoly and digital colonization kind of goes hand in hand. And hence, technologically, we should be sovereign. Absolutely. So bring that that up. Absolutely. So if you don't have control over your technology, you will always be played around. Uh right? Now, let me take the example of since you mentioned about technological sovereignty and and Mm. the importance the cyber bombing of the Netan centrifuge in Iran, mm. the Tehran cyber uh, bombing. That yes. was the same epoch-making moment as the mm. nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki mm. in 6th August 1945 and 9th August 1945. It was a similar mm. situation because now you could see that with cyber, you could actually mm. physically destroy. Mm-hmm. You made the nuclear centrifuges spin faster and mm. self-destruct. True. But how did it happen? Mm-hmm. It happened because three countries collaborated because... Okay the key country mm-hmm. had technological sovereignty, even if they did not own the technology. But so we're not saying that you own technology because you can't. In the new mm-hmm. world, you can't own all the technology. True. But you've got control over the technology. Mm-hmm. As a sovereign nation, do you, have, mm-hmm. do you have the ability to get these technologies together and, and bring it to a purpose that you will it to, to, to do? You don't have that. Mm-hmm. But when you destruct it, you as in whichever governments yeah, are involved, yeah. mm-hmm. you had the power to get three countries together, mm-hmm. get their technologies together and mm-hmm. destroy the centrifuge which was not even connected to the internet. There was How an air gap. How power of technology defines, Jayjit? You've questioned our audience and me several times. Yes. Do we have power to stop uh, WhatsApp? Do we yes. have power to control technology? Yes. How do you understand this power? I mean, what are So you it's a very, to? very, in fact, um, mm. your question is even more fundamental than that because what mm. is power is a question mark. But let me explain it in a much more lighter manner because yeah, those sure. are much deeper questions. Mm-hmm. Um, if you stop WhatsApp as the government because, you know, WhatsApp allowed uh, mm. some communication to go through which led to, uh, you know, people getting lynched and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, If you stop WhatsApp, the economy gets impacted. Mm -hmm. Everybody is using WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. It has become a digital utility. Utility. Can you live if 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 there's only one company supplying you electricity and they decide to shut you off? You cannot live. Mm -hmm. The economy will not survive. So it's more about creating competition. It is about competition and it's about interoperability. Interoperability. Right now, in electricity, what happens, one grid speaks to the other grids. You know, you can... Pass electricity yeah, one true, from one true. grid to so another you can grid. bypass. This you can though. bypass. If this grid mm-hmm. says that I want to charge you more, you say, fine, mm-hmm. I don't need you. Mm-hmm. I'll get another grid in. There is interoperability. True, true. If WhatsApp says um, I don't want to service you unless mm-hmm. you give away all your data to me, mm-hmm. otherwise, you know, I will not um, service you. What is the power you have against WhatsApp? Can you have an alternative? And that's where we need to be Atam Nirbhar. Have that our own where, WhatsApp, have our own. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Makes in sense. areas which are critical for the nation, yeah. for the operation of the nation or mm-hmm. enforce interoperability. Mm-hmm. We True. should be able to do one of the two. Jump from one to another should be like a smooth transition. Atam Nirbhar is not about snatching our business. It's not about what Britain did. Mm-hmm. You know, Britain... Yes. Um, uh-huh. illegally stopped British the Indian ships from being sold mm-hmm. they illegally stopped Indian textiles from being sold Indian True. textiles dominated the global trade True. Indian mm-hmm. ships Indian steel Indian sugar zinc also brass iron you mm-hmm. name it mm-hmm. uh, Indians, uh, Indian technological products mm-hmm. dominated the world mm-hmm. it was stopped one by one it was mm-hmm. stopped one by one Systematic. And, and that's not what we are saying in terms of art we are saying let's have the global rule of law mm-hmm. we'll follow that but follow it fairly and mm. give a, a level playing field to everyone. Mm. And we should not allow corporations to have disproportionate power where they are more powerful than the government. Mm. 
right right uh, they can say i if if you don't follow me i'll stop whatsapp mm. but you can't say that if you don't follow me i'll stop you from operating in india mm-hmm. because who gets impacted more my we, own huh? my own people yeah, the, the government and the people get impacted more so jeji then government should uh, create such an ecosystem that the local innovation thrives that incubation Absolutely. of startups are encouraged you know indigenous knowledge and technologies take a for a fr- forefront like they take the front seat absolutely so, i think huh? that is the direction that we have started going and mm-hmm. and i think it has taken us a, a decade from you know around 2005 when i started talking about these issues in fact from 2010 to 2013 14 um i was running this uh, national conclave on technological sovereignty mm-hmm. with the military at the manaksha center mm-hmm. uh these and people who understood and who you know got mm-hmm. different um, um uh, perspectives of the same issue uh that has led to led to a ground swell mm-hmm. uh of uh, deep understanding of the issues and we have seen the current minister of states and ministers uh, coming with very very deep understanding of these issues and there from the last 4 5 years you will see a a massive change in our ecosystem of startups mm-hmm. you see a coup coming up mm-hmm. right uh, against uh, which is in the same space as twitter and yeah. and coup has done wonderfully mm-hmm. it has grown much faster than what twitter grew at the mm-hmm. same stage true true uh, mojo for tiktok and absolutely yeah, absolutely yeah. so every you know one of these um, uh, systems we have had mm-hmm. our own uh, indian equal in fact we had a uh, very unique indian solutions coming up like easygov which mm-hmm. provides a unique mm-hmm. benefit you know a a, a, a uh, targeted benefits to the users citizens, and as it to the yeah. citizens i think mm-hmm. those are terrific uh, platforms that are coming up so mm-hmm. we are coming up with those platforms uh, mm-hmm. we do need to accelerate it and in the meantime the recognition of the fact that Mm. uh there is an issue of technological sovereignty there's an issue of digital colonization mm-hmm. um because we still see people um, saying hey what is wrong by using let's say chinese phones for that matter mm-hmm. right what is wrong by uh, mm-hmm. if we allow free flow of uh, mm-hmm. of applications and and trade and so on and so forth mm-hmm. because there's no such thing as free flow yeah true we have understood right? now huh? so earlier there was a western hegemony then china mm-hmm. woke up and then china posed uh, has you know has mm-hmm. become one of the leaders in technology and mm-hmm. hats off to them for doing that they have done excellent for their economy but we can't follow chinese model we are a free liberal thinking democracy well you know um the way i look at it is that we see uh, i see democracy and free liberal thinking uh, more as an excuse okay. uh, because globally um 49% of the break even countries were were democracies those who mm-hmm. grew extremely fast only mm-hmm. 51% were were autocracies, autocracies. um you know when uh, taiwan became mm-hmm. very rich very quickly it became one of the first uh, tiger economies we said mm-hmm. well it's a small country it can do that india is large we can't do it mm-hmm. uh, then you know korea became rich still a small country right <laughs> singapore then, for that matter then china Estonia. became rich yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, and then china became rich True. oh they are an autocratic country we then saw everybody are. else <laughs> yeah. uh, getting rich no what i'm saying is that mm-hmm. democratic countries were also getting rich and okay. small countries were getting rich so okay. earlier we had an excuse they mm-hmm. are small we are big so we can't grow faster mm-hmm. china smashed that Yeah, right. is it we are big and we are growing we are growing right and mm-hmm. then you know brazil also became rich the brazil's uh, you know per capita Growth income is, is significantly is more than very india's impressive, true. forget about brazil true. botswana's per capita income is four mm-hmm. times india's mm-hmm. per capita income mm-hmm. uh, right and they have used their diamonds very well they have plump, you know put it back into social infrastructure good education good healthcare so what excuse are we left with they are also liberal then okay jay ji then the ball comes back to your court give some uh, nuggets of wisdom to the youth of today through this podcast one you know um uh control of technology is important okay uh, that's if you want to be re- to live well and mm. you, if you want to be a prosperous country and you want to provide to your people to your family mm. access to technology is very critical mm-hmm. nobody is going to give you the technology in a dish mm-hmm. on a platter mm. and uh, it's a shame to be the mm. second country to have that technology or the third country to have the technology okay India has a responsibility to go ahead and build the technologies that humanity needs. Okay, great. We have the largest humanity in the world, you know, mm-hmm. between China and us, we are number 1, number 2 in that mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. We've got all the resources that we mm-hmm. ever need for an mm-hmm. industrial revolution for, you know, mm-hmm. any industry that we create. We have the manpower, we have everything. Mm-hmm. Why can't we go ahead and build the next set of technologies that we need? Mm-hmm. Why is it that we are waiting for somebody else to build the satellite mm-hmm. connectivity for high-speed satellite mm-hmm. which was a known thing? 
for you know for a decade and a half i have been taking that proposal to government again and again hmm. saying we have the population to actually have high speed satellite connectivity hmm. uh, wherein um, we can recover the money of the launches and the satellite in less than a year's time mm-hmm. uh, why are we not doing that the mm-hmm. doing that you know um, we would need supersonic transport aircraft very quickly mm-hmm. the next uh, you know set of uh, uh, growth that will happen or uh, you know change that will happen will be mm-hmm. your regular airlines will go away and you'll have supersonic flights happening mm-hmm. at least over the I heard trans- it yesterday routes, itself right? there is yeah. what are we doing about it we will mm-hmm. be the number fifth nation and be happy about it Mm. Right. What did we do in the last, um, you know, twenty years when everybody else was investing into batteries and electric mm. vehicles? Mm. It's only in the last five years that we have woken up. Woken up. Oh. Everybody else was giving market access, promised market access, funding, mm. research into developing batteries, developing mm. electric uh, economy. We did not. Mm-hmm. So why are we waiting for others to take the lead and then we'll, you know, catch up? Take it back on. Why can't we sit back and say India and Indians need this? humanity needs this so what are the three main technologies of future i wouldn't say what is the three main future no technologies of the future i can probably say what are the main what are the critical technologies for india as an example okay you know with the climate change happening true um you will have a challenge in terms of agriculture true, right true. maybe some areas will become more productive some areas will become less productive but you will go through a phase where you have a challenge food scarcity is always an issue true. it's it's a national security issue very true we have technology which can develop meat in the lab mm. the same technology can be used to develop food in the lab your agricultural true. vegetables and I grains have read and your so article. on yeah true, true right so why are we not investing in it at a war footing okay who needs it more than us we have 16% of the global population to feed mm. true we need to have the technology Mm. In fact um your animal husbandry is one of the most polluting industries in the world it takes mm. 17% of the land mm. and contributes a significant amount of the greenhouse uh, greenhouse gas emission and we are the largest um, the number of consumers and we are the largest number of cattle in the world mm-hmm. um can we reduce the carbon footprint mm. can we you know, move over to lab based meat i think from an indian perspective that's very very critical okay um quantum becomes another very very critical issue because um, everything that we are doing today will be totally changed will break True. your banking will go for a six i can yeah. break your encryption in banking using quantum and therefore security cyber security, security. True. so True. if you don't have control over quantum, quantum computing, computing you will again be nowhere in the in the technology True. world because you know the whole uh, the start of this conversation you said what is digital economy true and if we need to have you know digital economy we need to have quantum computing otherwise digital yeah. economy starts crumbling okay. you won't be able to make a payment through any of the e-commerce sites right. because uh-huh. it will be all compromised true so that's that's number 2 from my uh, mm. perspective mm. number 3 is a whole bunch of other things which mm. basically depends on how significant it will contribute to our economy mm-hmm. um not everything is about the next um you know technology to create but also the infrastructure to create okay right um we are creating roads at a breakneck speed i think mm. um nowhere in the past humanity has been able to create roads at the rate at which india is creating those roads mm. right we're creating railway lines we're creating you know gas pipelines electricity lines all these linear infrastructure that we're creating we are not putting a fiber along with it mm-hmm. right so we are wasting that opportunity because if you do it subsequently the it cost becomes be, yeah, very high very true and you have the right of way issue you have to mm. dig it break it put it back and then somebody else will cut it dig it and so on and so forth it costs almost nothing to mm. put a, a, fiber. a fiber along with very all well the linear said. infrastructure very that well we are putting in. true true right so we need to see it from our lenses what is that india needs what is that indians need and not just go ahead and see what is that the rest of the world is doing it's good Mm-hmm. and important to see what they're doing but from our perspective these are you know basic fundamentals that we need to look at dr jayjit i'm really thankful to you it's been a very stimulating afternoon if i could say and plus i think the learning the way you've connected all the dots about and in the the undercurrent throughout that discussion was how great india could was and could be and that and will is what, be and will be, will and, be. and will be yeah. so i close on this optimistic note and thanks to dr jayjit for being with us my pleasure thank you thanks a lot